our next speaker, the last speaker before our break, is Bishop Sebastian Francis of Penang. He is president of the Catholic Bishops Conference of Malaysia, Singapore, and Brunei. Please, Bishop Francis. Dear Brother Bishops, Fratelli Tutti, well, allow me to confine myself to some reflection and a paradigm for worship and formation based on all that has been expressed here in the last eight days. And it is the same spirit whether we are in Lex Orandi or Lex Credendi, from worship to formation, or Lex Vivendi in life, it is the same spirit that is moving surely, clearly, gently among us. And everything that has been expressed from our hopes to our disappointments, to our failures, to our aspirations and uncertainties, simply means that you have brought what your people are experiencing. So let's move on to worship and see if there is pressure now on us as we move to the second part of this conference that we have to address the people of Asia and the people of our churches and give them a direction. And as the Archbishop of Manila said, are we able to speak with authority like how Peter spoke, we and the Holy Spirit have decided that this is the direction for the church in Asia. Could we have that kind of confidence to regain our role as successors of the apostles? So let's move first to the first slide, which is about worship. And it is in the context of an encounter between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And I can't help but feel when I listen to this text that actually uh, we experience this more intensely during the pandemic when there was no more public worship. And Jesus told her, yet a time is coming and has now come. And that he said 2,000 years ago, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. And the narrative on worship was not about the morality of the Samaritan woman who had several men in her life. The narrative of worship was not about religion, which on which mountain shall we worship, whether in Mount Gerasim or in Mount Zion or in Jerusalem or wherever. The narrative on worship was not even, uh, not about gender, that Jesus male and the Samaritan woman female. And it was not about race and ethnicity and so on and so forth, he being a Jew and she being a Samaritan. But it was about worshipping God in spirit and in truth. And many of us made an interior journey during the pandemic. And all we could cling on to when there was no more external worship was the obligation to continue to worship God in spirit and in truth, carrying our people in our souls when we came before the altar to celebrate the Eucharist. St. Faustina said, a single day without the Eucharist is a dangerous day in the life of a bishop or priest. And what about the people? Yes, many of us were tempted not to celebrate the Eucharist because there was no audience. There was no um, congregation. But it still remains that we celebrate the Eucharist vicariously. And regardless of whether there is an audience or no audience, we carry every single person entrusted to our care into the Eucharistic 
table so that nobody is left out. And I wish to plead again that could the Eucharist and coming from Asia focus not on being a reward for practicing Catholics or baptized and practicing Catholics, but a, not a reward for fidelity. But can the Eucharist be a nourishment for the wounded, the sick, whether they are sick physically or spiritually, and a nourishment for sinners? So these are some thoughts about the Eucharist. Next slide. And almost everything that has been said here for the last eight days, it is interesting how the Spirit seems to be telling the church in Asia, yes, we are reading the signs, but we don't remain with the signs. We may get utterly disillusioned with the sheer magnitude of issues and crises and conflicts and problems. Yes, we must read because we are rooted in reality. But we also need to ask, what is the Spirit saying to the church in Asia? A question that was raised in the book of Revelation. And three, three words stand out. The church in Asia must be creative, must be inclusive, must be bridge building. Because the Father is creative. The Son is inclusive. And if His sacrifice on the cross was exclusive, then it means nothing to us. He died to save creation and humanity. And so everything that has been uttered here is pointing towards being a creative church, being an inclusive church, and being a bridge-building church. So I would like to suggest, a, next slide, a paradigm shift. I dare not call it a shift. Let's just call it a paradigm, both for worship and for formation. It must even re be reflected in the very language that we speak here in Asia. The very language that we use in worship and information, that it must be creative, inclusive, and bridge building. And as we were told in Bandung, be a new way of being church, not putting new wines in old wine skins, then it's going to burst. But a new way of being church, and in Chiang Mai, as the Asian Mission Congress, we were told that as Asians, we are storytellers. And we like to tell the story, share the story of Jesus. And Mongolia went further and said, let us whisper the gospel to everyone here in Asia. We are not in Asia going to lord it over. So, I suggest a paradigm. A paradigm for formation. And in the past... We have been very proud, maybe, and it has served us well, that we are a church of clergy, religious, and laity. Can I suggest that we go back to our roots, to our scriptural roots, and that we are a church of apostles? And I'm acutely aware that I'm speaking primarily to the successors of the apostles who are gathered here. And as successors of the apostles, we must hold the primacy of love, the primacy of truth. Edith Stein, Saint Edith Stein said, love and truth, one without the other is destructive. Love without truth or truth without love is destructive. We must hold the primacy of unity and continuity not an emotional, sentimental unity, but a unity based on the continuation of the mission entrusted by the Father and the Son primarily to the Holy Spirit 
and through the Holy Spirit to all of us. And we, the, the substitute for self-absorption or self-indulgence or self-preservation is the way of kenosis. That we are church of primarily of disciples and that the primary sacrament is not the priesthood, is not marriage, but is disciples. Yes, we need clergy who are disciples. We need consecrated men and women who are disciples. And we need laity who are disciples. And the primary mission of disciples, especially of our lay brothers and sisters as disciples, is in the world. Not ministry in the church, which is necessary, but the primary mission of all the baptized is to be witnessing in the world, in society, on the way to work, as our speaker said. And finally, we are a church of the people of God, what Pope Francis calls Fratelli Tutti. So I wish to end now with two considerations, further considerations, that we move from membership to discipleship. And as I said, the unity that we speak about is based on the continuity of the mission entrusted to the apostles and to the disciples under the Lordship of the Holy Spirit. But let's not forget that this mission is primarily entrusted by the Father and the Son to the Holy Spirit. And therefore the Holy Spirit will succeed in the mission entrusted to the Spirit by the Father and the Son. And we, Pope Francis and all of us, are called to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And at this point, as we are midway through our conference, I ask that we remain faithful to the Holy Spirit by remaining faithful to the process that has been charted for us by Cardinal uh, Charles Bow and his entire team. Yes, we may be tired, or we have no right to be tired, as Arch Cardinal Krian Sak said, but let us be faithful to the process, and by being faithful to the process, be faithful to the Holy Spirit. And maybe in Asia, we got to move from a Christology and all the Christological debates of the first five centuries. Because Christ, Jesus Christ, did not bring us to himself and, he, and stop there. Beyond himself, he led us into the mystery of the Trinity. And therefore, we must move gently from Christology to the fullness of God as a community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And finally, I suggest that Bandung gave us a triple dialogue, a dialogue with the poor, a dialogue with religions, a dialogue with culture. Can I suggest that we also need, especially in Asia, to excite our young people, to excite everyone, a dialogue of joy, the joy of the gospel, as Pope Francis calls it, a dialogue of mercy, the mercy of the Father of Jesus Christ, and a dialogue of hope, a hope generated by the Spirit. And 2025 is going to be the Jubilee year of hope. So what is going to the next slide? What is going to be the next crisis? God knows. Some are suggesting, next, next, some are suggesting that there is a financial crisis coming soon, or whether it's going to be a man-made tragedy, or whether it's going to be a natural tragedy, a Laudato Si', a disregard for Laudato Si' tragedy, or whatever, or another virus lurking somewhere, but whatever it is, let us 
play our role and give Asia and the people of Asia and our churches in Asia the leadership that they are looking from us. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Bishop, uh, for your presentation and for your proposal for the new paradigm of the church that should be creative, inclusive, and bridge building. Thank you very much. Let us now take two minutes of silence prayer. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. I say to Bishop Francis that the right of tiring and resting is in heaven. <laughs> now, it's still time so that we can have questions Question and, and answers. Answer. Yeah, we open still have floor. around 10 minutes, so... Please, those who want to intervene to express the comments or questions. Yeah. Please, Bishop Pascalis. Just to comment about the dialogue of joy and the dialogue of hope that uh, Bishop from Penang mentioned before. I think uh, this is a main role also that we can offer to the world because Jesus, as uh, he preached the gospel, and we know that the meaning of the gospel is to bring good news for the people. And thank you for uh, the mention about this aspect of our faith. And I really want to underline the joy of the gospel. And then we bring also the dialogue of joy and the dialogue of hope. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Please, uh, Bishop. just wanted to share the need for catechesis, especially through digital ways, which was emphasized by our uh, young friend uh, Karpayo from Mumbai. Uh, really, that is one of the main tasks that we have to take up in our ministry or the bishops and priests in future. That means integrating digital ways of communicating the message of Christ and the love of Christ to our children and the youth uh, through the di digital ways. I think from accompaniment alone, we will not do that. We have to work with them in catechetical formation. 
as we walk with our uh, candidates to priesthood in the seminaries, we have to walk with them, discuss with them, take their ways of communication as our ways of communication for uh, catechesis and bringing the message of Christ uh, to them. So that is a very important field in which our young friend is just uh, calling us to engage ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bishop. Please. It's not a question. I'm Philip Neri Ferram from India. I don't want, not a question, just a comment. I really want to appreciate the various inputs and very especially what Bishop Sebastian said last. Ecclesiology of discipleship. We are so used to talk about clergy, religious, laity. This terminology somehow separates us. I think ecclesiology of discipleship, that all of us are disciples who are baptized, sent with different functions in the church. I, I really appreciate this input of Bishop Sebastian. Thank you, Bishops. One more <laughs> or two, and then I will give opportunity to Please the speakers to one. give their comments also. Please. I am Archbishop Joanne Cruz from Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, all these talks this morning were very enlightening and helpful, thought-provoking. Uh, uh, we need to really enter into the digital world in order to make ourselves present in Asia more and more so that we can influence Asia. And then a last talk uh, by Bishop Sebastian Francis, uh, worship in spirit and truth, though it is a very old idea from the gospel, but Asia, this can be the big means, the good way to enter into interreligious dialogue. We can go beyond our traditional things, worship in truth uh, and spirit, and joy and hope we can bring to Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you. My, I'm, I'm from the Philippines, uh, Bishop Colin, uh, from uh, the Diocese of Kitapawan, uh, Mindanao. My point really is not a question, but I would like to, to, to uh, make a comment uh, with regards to the uh, future of the church in terms of its uh, evangelization. Really, we have to admit and we have to uh, uh, look seriously that uh, we have to enter into the digital world in terms of evangelization. And uh, EWTN in America and in many parts of the world has proven to be very effective uh, uh, in their evangelization program. Here in Asia, we have Radio Veritas Asia. My point is, I wonder if we can come up with some kind of a resolution or with some kind of, a, of an agreement. Uh, let's come up with some kind of a uh, of uh, Radio Veritas Asia that is almost as equal and as similar and as effective and aggressive as EWTN. Uh, I, I, I learned uh, that a good friend of mine, Bishop from Sri Lanka, Bishop uh, Raymond, will become the next head of Radio Veritas. And I think uh, Radio Veritas Asia, and I think uh, he would need all our support that uh, Radio Veritas Asia uh, would become uh, almost like EWTN uh, to enter into, uh, into that digital world of being able to spread the word of God all over Asia. And therefore, what I'm trying to say is uh, can we as FABC 
make that commitment, make that resolution that we support and we endorse Radio Veritas Asia to go into that field of digital work in terms of aggressive uh, evangelization for Asia. Thank you. Thank you. The, last. the, the two last <laughs> before we go to break, <laughs> please. Thank you for giving me the chance. The, from the last presentation, His Excellency presented wonderfully so many good points. And one of the important points for me, the dialogue of cultures. And the, oh, in this point, what he mentioned about the people of God, Fratelli Tutti. And especially in Indian subcontinent and Indian cultures, many times in the church, we use the, uh, many castes, scheduled castes, so many vocabularies. And for me, I would like to abolish all these words. Because these inferior people create different castes and classes, but what Bishop mentioned, and especially the Holy Father, Pratelli Tutti, people of God, and that will help us for the evangelization. We can dignify people and bring them to the same dignity, and it is useful, especially in Asia and especially India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, in these countries. And that is why I would strongly propose abolishing all this terminology and vocabularies and using people of God, Pratelli Tutti. Thank you. Thank you. Please, Cardinal. Well, not to be too long. I just want to support Bishop Sebastian, I think all the presentations this morning has been summarized with a big challenge that uh, as Bishop Sebastian has done. Mainly is to go to the gospel. We have a lot of theological jargons. We have a lot of pastoral, uh, uh, very trivial talks. But I think if Asia has to have any specific contribution, the voice has been heard. Paradigm shift is needed. Missionary discipleship has to be emphasized. People of God, we have to walk with. And these are the parameters uh, for us to go to the gospel of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. So once again, on behalf of all of us here, I want to thank all our four speakers this morning. We appreciate all your enriching and precious presentation, your thoughts and your say. So let us give once again a big applause.